Good evening. It's good to be here with you. And I'm kind of relieved the crowd didn't get thinner from last week. That's always a priest's fear. People run away after class number one. But tonight we're here with part two in our 11-part series introduction to orthodoxy. And tonight we're speaking about uh, introducing an orthodox Christian worldview. And we'll be looking at various, at our worldview, contrasting with heterodox Christian and non-Christian worldviews. We'll also take a peek at the very end of the evening at some insights from Father Stephen Freeman using his metaphor of the one-story or two-story universe. So let's get into our material tonight. Last week we spent a good bit of time establishing a framework for beginning to talk about the Orthodox Christian faith. To help us get behind the dogma and the doctrines that are at, in the heart and mind of the church, I borrowed heavily from a little book which you see on the screen here, called Encountering the Mystery by Patriarch Bartholomew. And um, in that talk last week, we focused on the theme of persons. Persons being a key for understanding, uh, beginning to encounter the mystery of God. And we spoke about person as mystery, and we referenced St. Macarius the Great, within the human heart, unfathomable depths there are, In it is death and it is life. The human person is an unfathomable mystery. We looked as well at persons as truly free, uh, seeing the human person as a a reality, truly becoming himself in in freedom vis-a-vis God and vis-a-vis other people. We looked at persons in relation, and we spoke about people relating to each other because God himself is relational, Father, Son, and Spirit in unity, in trinity, uh, relating to one another from all time, from before all time. And we spoke about persons as as restored icons of wholeness uh, and the importance of this word uh, integrity or uh, chastity. In in Greek, it's sophrosini, this having this integral wholeness that we're called to as persons, integrated with God, with each other, and with all creation. And this becomes the foundation then for us even speaking of doctrines and dogmas and the details of Orthodox Christian faith. So you have a foundation first. So I want to shift gears now into into the theme for, for this particular week. And Imagine, if you will, for a second, an Orthodox Christian missions conference. And this is actually true. There's a, there is every year a missions conference that gathers in Pennsylvania. And you get guys and girls, bishops and priests and lay people from all over the country. And they gather to talk about how we share the gospel. And I've seen photos from these before. And it kind of looks something like this. You end up with a very kind of like cosplay kind of environment. But the reality is uh, when we gather... It's often very fractious, and there's a lot of debate and a lot of very candid uh, conversations. And uh, one, of, one of the conferences yielded, at one point, this reflection about what it means to share orthodoxy. And the challenges of not just sharing orthodox doctrine and dogmas, but getting to the very heart of what it is we're trying to do as orthodox Christians. So... Let me read this. This is a reflection from a missions conference. Imagine for a moment that this conference would be what it would be like and what we would be talking about if this were an evangelical missions conference rather than an orthodox one. Aside from the obvious outward difference, the cleaner cut image, the business suits, not looking like your Lord of the Rings, maybe we would have a rock band lead us in the latest kind of hits of Christian music. But beyond that, the topics we would be discussing would be almost entirely different. We would not be focusing on spiritual formation, probably not much on worship, certainly not on historic Christian worship as we understand it in the church. It's unlikely that fasting or discipline spiritually would come up as topics. More likely we would be discussing how we accommodate our churches to to worship in society, to our society, so as to make it more appealing and more marketable. If it sounds to you like I'm being unfair, then you probably have not read much in the way of Protestant church growth material. Now suppose that an evangelical were to enter 
our conference, to walk into this place where we're gathering, aside from being unfamiliar with the outward differences, such as such a person would not properly understand most of what had gone on here, it would not be out of stubbornness on his part. It would be because, in a sense, we do not speak the same language. His entire frame of reference is foreign to the Orthodox Christian worldview. Certainly, there are many points of contact between Protestantism and Orthodoxy. We use many of the same terms. We both speak of the Scriptures, of Jesus Christ, of the Trinity. But these points of contact, in some ways, make it more difficult for a Protestant to understand and accept the Orthodox. And perhaps to an even greater degree, these are huge stumbling blocks to the pathway that leads towards developing a truly Orthodox mind. This is a really bold statement, and it's one that is a bit scandalous, I think. We're, he's actually saying here that there are ways that non-Orthodox Christians approach things that constitute a barrier to understanding the Orthodox Christian faith at its heart, the worldview of the Orthodox. I remember when I was um, a, a newly exploring Orthodoxy, I was in my late teens, and I remember reading an article by this guy. Who is this? Father Seraphim Rose, Father Seraphim Rose who's a, a holy man of the Orthodox Church, um, probably one day to be canonized a saint, as he probably should be. Uh, I remember he was, he was very feisty. He, he had died already when I read the article, but he was a very feisty kind of figure. Uh, he was very bold in defending Orthodox uh, Christianity and the Orthodox worldview. And he once said that he believed that if you're a Protestant, you should spend more time becoming Orthodox because you must unlearn what you have learned. And he really he said this very strongly and very pointedly. Uh, and, and if you think about it, uh, here's an analogy that might help you. Uh, when, when someone is learning uh, martial arts, you have to learn a certain style of fighting. If you're doing karate, you learn a certain way. Uh, and it takes a long time to learn those skills. If you're learning Taekwondo, you learn a certain set of skills, certain moves. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, my son did that and really liked it. But you can't do certain things in that, in that martial art that you can do in others. And so uh, you have a challenge then of cross-disciplinary cross, uh, action. And practice is really important. <laughs> practice is great. But, but you can know judo, judo like Putin, and, and then lose in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because it's like a different language. It's a different discipline. And so it creates some challenges. Um, one of my favorite experiences in the movies, um, particularly when I was a boy, was listening to, to the sage advice of Yoda. And Yoda would say things like this, right? He would, he would say to Luke, you're, you're too old to begin the training. I remember thinking, what's wrong with him? Like, Luke, Luke's like a young guy. But no, no, it, uh, that later on you realize the younglings are like really little. Jedis are like four or five or babies when they become Jedis. But you have, to, you have to begin the training when you're young. You have to be shaped by that training. It has to really form your whole personality. And you have to know that discipline really well. And I think, I think people that are Protestant have their own kind of approach. And, and the Orthodox certainly have their own approach and, and worldview. And um, even more, though... Um, I think it's important for us as Americans to pause and realize that if we're going to be serious about learning about the Orthodox Christian faith, we cannot be like a typical American cartoon character. Um, we need real discipline, like Yoda or Daniel LaRusso. These are good models of like learning something and acquiring skill. But unfortunately, most, most of the time, we're doing something much more like this. <laughs> the Kung Fu Panda is, I love that, I hate him and I love him all at the same time. He's cute, he's funny, he's entertaining, uh, but uh, he is a classic American. He wants mastery of whatever it is, is it karate? I don't know. Kung Fu. Kung Fu. He wants master of Kung Fu right now. He wants to be a master of it right now. And he wants to, uh, he's a nice guy, but he's utterly unskilled and careless and lazy. And in the movie, he, he actually doesn't change at all, other than he magically acquires these, these kung fu skills. It's a classic American story of, like, you know, imputed grace, right? You say a prayer, and all of a sudden, everything's different. And all of a sudden, your whole life is, is changed. Um, being a kung fu master for American people is really easy, right? Whether we're talking about spiritually, we're talking about this kind of model. We just feel like we can do it, and we should be able to do it. So, but some of the Orthodox that are here and some of you that are new would say, you know, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I accept that Orthodoxy is difficult. Um, 
If you're Orthodox a long time, you might even say, well, okay, I've been Orthodox a long time, and I'm very Orthodox. I've been Orthodox five years, or two years, or ten years. I've been Orthodox more than half my life now. But I would say this. This is really important for all of us to understand. Every single American, and that includes Catholics, and pagans, and Orthodox, and post-Christian people, deep down, we are formed by American Protestantism. And specifically, a degradation of American Protestantism that we might call, it was coined um, 20 or 30 years ago, moralistic, relativistic, therapeutic deism. Have you heard of that before? Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, it, it, it's a term that was, that was conjured up to describe a kind of post-Christian American sensibility, a post-dogmatic American Protestant life. And I, I, I would argue this worldview pervades Americana. It is the default setting that, we're all, that we all come with if we're born in this country, if we're, if we're brought up in this country. Well, what is it? What is this moralistic, relativistic, therapeutic deism? It posits first that there is a God who created and ordered the world and kind of vaguely watches over human life on earth. You know, and so he kind of gives you good juju and like, it's sort of like a, a nice souped up deism. It's a nicer deism, because deism is more like God's a clockmaker out there and doesn't care. This kind of deism is a little sweeter and a little more, little more engaged, you might say. Another feature is God wants his people to be good. He, he wants them to be, to be nice, to be fair with each other, as taught in the books like the Bible and other religious texts. And after all, they're all kind of the same anyway. But that's what God wants, and that's sort of a nice way to live. Another tenet would be the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Uh, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except in the emergency. So you can call on God in a pickle. This is, again, different from classic deism. Uh, but all these things would be, uh, would be part of this. Finally, uh, this worldview says good people go to heaven or some kind of heaven. And of course, you're all good people. And that's nice. So this is sort of a, a, an approach that we find among many Americans by default. Not only is this worldview not orthodox, but it also works perniciously against orthodoxy in that it fosters an autonomous independence coupled with a strong belief in personal and national exceptionalism tinged with the late American sense of entitlement, singed with pervasive laziness. And you can thank me for that quote. That's for me. And I'm just feeling feisty today. I'm sorry. A little feisty. I, everyone that knows me knows I'm a real patriot. I love my country. I don't, I don't want to be Russian or Greek. I'm American. I love being American. But I think I love my country. I can be critical of my country and, I, and the way we have sort of fallen into these things over the last several hundred years. So I think this is an important point, which takes us back to uh, where we're heading. Well, so that we can better understand Orthodox Christianity and how it is unique, let us ask ourselves, what are some different worldviews and how do these other worldviews help us better understand our cultural context here in America and other Orthodox uh, worldviews? Let's identify some of the worldviews. First of all, we have animist worldviews, pagan worldviews, uh, and they see the spiritual in everything. Animist religion is about controlling the forces that are out there. And so you, 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 know, you have a cult in a, in a city state and it's your local God and you propitiate that God. You give sacrifices and various offerings in order to kind of direct the God in the way you want to go. This was, this was the gods that surrounded Israel. And Israel's gods was unique because it was not, God was not like those other gods at all. He could not be propitiated. He could not be manipulated. Uh, but in animist worldview, in animist worldview, you have gods who are controlled by the cults of those various divinities, and this was true in Babylon and in Greece and in Africa and many other uh, native native lands, including you know Indiana Jones, the Temple of Doom. Uh, there, there's sort of um, there's sort of all over the world we find instances of this kind of worldview. We also find. Uh, a lot more elevated worldview, like the Asian practices versus Asian faith, Asian, I, I say practices here because it's more different religious practices rather than religion or faith. Um, on the left, we see a Taoist ceremony, which looks a lot like a liturgy, doesn't it? The lining up of the clergy. Uh, Confucius being a, a great philosopher of this particular um, 
uh, example of this philosophy. Um, and so religion or the cult of the nation is about duty and honor and stability. And there's a great deal of philosophy undergirding all of that, which leads directly to uh, an, anal an analog really in the West, which would be Hellenistic or Greek philosophy, somewhat similar perhaps. Uh, I'm no philosopher, but there's a lot of echoes. Um, Stoicism, Platonism, Neoplatonism, all the various uh, Hellenistic Greek philosophies that we find uh, would be instances, examples of, of this kind of worldview, and perhaps there are several worldviews packed into that. And then we, we could speak about a pre-modern Christian worldview, uh, and we would, we would really frankly say this is the early Christian or Orthodox worldview that we still aim to hold to. Um, religion, if you will, or the, or the faith, the practice of religion is about formation and preparation of the person for communion with God. That's the whole point of the entire approach, is this very simple thing to form the person so that he or she is ready to become united to God, uh, this sort of approach. And then we find later on, of course, um, enlightenment, which is a kind of Christian approach, you might say. Um, this, this becomes the, the sort of modern Christian secular enlightenment, which is the heart of Protestant America. You know, you have, you have rationalism, um, all these things informing it. You have also a, a post-Christian, now nihilistic, hedonist worldview. And hedonism goes from Nietzsche to something more like this. Um, but that's kind of where we are in the, in the current frame of things. So... Um, the one good thing about the postmodern or nihilist hedonist worldview is that it, it really rejects the idea of scientifically studying God, which was a hallmark of the Enlightenment approach, right? You're going you're gonna to dissect God, you're going to understand God, you're going to parse God, and then you get parse the scriptures, par parse everything, and you get to these guys and they give up. They're done. They're, they can't do any more with it. They're finished. It rejects Enlightenment Christianity. It rejects Christianity. God is dead, and all this kind of stuff. So uh, it's, a, it's a major shift. So our, heart, our, our own hodgepodge worldview in America seems to be informed, not by any one of these things, but by a variety of these other worldviews and influences. We might identify the Italian Renaissance as, as, a, as a root in our, in our system, which of course inspires the Enlightenment to some extent, uh, Christian humanism, um, ancient wisdom from Greece and beyond, is a major feature in this. Then you have the, the Reformation as, as, as an influence in our hodgepodge of, of American worldview. Um, individualized spiritual experience and practice kind of predominating. Um, and of course, the scientific method becoming part of that. You subject the Bible to scrutiny. You uh, subject the faith to analysis. You deconstruct things. Um, uh, and then... Bible study arises in this context where you begin to sort of argue about what it means, that sort of thing. It's a very unusual approach for the Orthodox, actually. How do we encounter the Bible? We hear it. We hear it. Of course, we can read it too, but we primarily listen to it. We chant it. Uh, another kind of influence, which is related to these other two, is the tendency towards Textolatry, Father Hopko of Blessed Memory called it the Quranic view of Scripture, where we take the Bible and we, we almost divinize it, um, and we, we then, having raised it up, we then parse it, and then we're scandalized when it doesn't hold up to that level of scrutiny that we think it ought to have. So I, I recall my own childhood uh, being raised uh, with Southern Baptists nearby, and they would every single word was eternal. Every single word of the Bible was, you know, literally, I remember someone joked around 1611, which is the date the King James Bible was, was, was published, 1611 straight from heaven, you know, this idea that, that every single word that we've experienced in English is somehow from the Lord. Um, it's textolatry. It's a really odd, strange phenomenon that flows from these, the Reformation. It flows from the Renaissance and humanism and a kind of uh, over-elevation over of the text, over and above the church. Um, and Father Hopko actually argues that in, in, in saying that we, have a, we Americans have a Quranic view of Scripture, what he's saying is the Muslims have this theology that every single utterance in Arabic is, is a living part of Allah. And he says somehow that came over into various forms of Western Christianity where the Bible is almost co-eternal with God. 
Um, you even have a, I think you even have a, a network called Eternal Word Television. And the symbol is a Bible, which is sort of strange. For us, that's just odd. That's a Catholic network too, which is weird. But anyway. Uh, so another influence would be uh, that sort of shapes our worldview as Americans would be paranoia about authority, rejecting authority, afraid of authority, terrified of authority. Um, you know, and so we have this sort of knee-jerk reaction that every single opinion is my opinion is as valid as, as any of your opinions about anything, and vice versa. Um, and we see this today, actually, with like uh, WebMD, you know, people like self-diagnosing themselves and not going to their doctors, not trusting people, uh, because we kind of reject authority, we reject specialists, people that have knowledge, because there's a, this like flattening of knowledge. Some of that's accurate, but some of that's not accurate and is not helpful. But uh, Americans are really part of this. We reject a uh, hierarchy, we reject um, anything that could threaten our own autonomy, our own, our own individual identity. And so we end up with, uh, in our nation, 6,000 Protestant denominations and even more independent churches. It leads to um, a whole host of problems in our culture, atomization of religion, atomization of the Christian faith. Um, and so, uh, speaking personally, one of the things that challenged me in orthodoxy when I first encountered it was the claims orthodoxy made about being the church. And I was a classic, I mean, I was a classic, all of these things here, right? Like, you know, humanism, reformation, my own spiritual practice, my own view of the text, raising the text up, and then finally paranoia. Those were all part of my experience as a, as a young American experiencing orthodoxy. I remember being really offended when uh, I, want, I realized I like this orthodoxy stuff, it kind of fits with my own thing. I kind of like it. I like the icon a little bit. I like the communion. I like, I like the history. And I told my buddy, my godfather, I said, well, I'm ready. I'm ready to go to communion now. I'm, I want to go. And he said, oh, Justin, you can't do that. We have closed communion. I remember thinking, well, I like your church. I like the priest. I like most of what you're saying. I was like, well, do you want to be orthodox? I said, No. I said, but I like, I like it. It's, it's nice. It's cute. It's sweet. I like your baklava. It's, and and I, I did like it. But what was necessary was I, I had to lay aside my own desire to control things. I, had to be, I couldn't do the smorgasbord approach. I had to embrace the Orthodox faith. And I had to realize I couldn't pick and choose what I liked. I had, I had to, in a sense, submit to the whole fullness of the faith and let that fullness uh, become my fullness in life as well. It was very difficult for me. I think it's fair to say an Enlightenment American Protestant worldview can very easily lead to a post-Christian worldview, and that's where we are today. I won't say a lot more about that, but that's the current climate we're in, and anyone that says otherwise, I, I think they're, they're kidding themselves. Truth in our age has become relativized, and we get post-Christian, post-modernism, where nothing matters and you do whatever you want. And I, I, I rail on her a lot. It's unfair, but I'm going to say it again. You get this. You get Ayn Rand. You get someone like this. An individualist is a man who says, I will not run, run anyone's life nor let anyone run mine. I will not rule nor be ruled. I will not be a master nor a slave. I will not sacrifice myself to anyone nor sacrifice anyone to myself. This is like the apotheosis of everything for me. This is like where all of this could head. And uh, I hope, I'm, I'm sure the Orthodox faith re renounces specifically this kind of approach, and I hope all of us would as well. So the key quality of this approach and kind of where culture is now is egocentrism. Um, in her case, it could be a kind of demonic reserve or narcissism in other cases, or someone thinking like Americans, I deserve to be president or a rock star or a kung fu panda. I deserve to have all of the answers right now and get what I want right now. Um, but the orthodox worldview would say, stop, be patient, don't do this, do this. Don't do the kung fu panda, do karate kid. And because it's the slow cooker, the slow burn. And we are taking our time to be formed in the faith and that formation has all these different aspects to it. It's prayer. It's ascetical work. 
It's silence. It's spiritual reading. It's relationships building. It's, it's visiting with holy people. It's having conversations. It's having more silence. It's going to liturgy. All these things are shaping us for the contest. And the contest, of course, is a spiritual one. Um, so let us embrace not the Kung Fu guy, but embrace, uh, embrace the other approach here as we think about our own spiritual life and our journey uh, through this series as well. So I want to speak very briefly here about this cultural onion, the onion diagram. It's a tool for understanding worldview. Orthodoxy is not merely about behaviors or even our values. It's not just about morality. There's a lot of Christian kind of proclamations that are about, about rules or like things you don't do. Orthodoxy, we care about the commandments of God, absolutely. But what we're trying to get at tonight is much deeper than the commandments. It, it is not a matter of us converting to a moral code. Orthodoxy makes claims in our worldview. The very way we see the world and interact with the cosmos is, is framed by the Orthodox Christian faith. And so, just as we speak about God changing our heart, you know, personally, we want to we go to the heart of this cultural onion and go to the worldview and let my whole framework be challenged as I interact with the Orthodox Christian faith. So, I'm not telling you what the worldview is tonight. What I'm suggesting to you in this talk, rather, is that as you learn about our faith, as you interact with the prayers upstairs and your own prayers at home and trying to fast and failing and trying to be, have friends in the Orthodox, you're going to find that there's something much deeper than just the externals of our faith, this worldview that's at the heart of it, that, is, that we have to begin to kind of unpack and, and live and experience and know. So that's the invitation uh, here. So uh, one of our great saints in the Orthodox Church of the, of the, of the 19th century, St. Seraphim of Sarov. St. Seraphim offers us a living icon, a picture of the Orthodox worldview. Here's what was said about him. Actually, no, this is something he said about himself. What does it matter if I'm a monk, he said, and you are a layman? What God requires is true faith in himself, in his only begotten Son. In return... God generously bestows upon us the grace of the Holy Spirit. The Lord seeks hearts filled with love for God and for one's neighbor. This is the throne upon which he would sit and where he appears in the fullness of his heavenly glory. He says, My son, give me your heart. And he says, And all the rest I will give you myself. For indeed the kingdom of God can be contained within the human heart. And so we're trying in this series to go to the heart of things, not just learning external things, but the very heart of things right here and in the heart of our faith. So, um, I'd like to conclude tonight with a couple points. One of the most uh, useful metaphors I found uh, for helping to frame the Orthodox Christian worldview is offered by Father Stephen Freeman, uh, whom many of you know. Father Stephen uh, was a founding priest of this parish he was the dean at the time that our parish was founded 20 years ago. He'll be here, I'm sure, for our anniversary in early winter. Um, but he talks about the one-story universe versus the two-story universe. And for him, he says, most, most Western Christians, certainly American Christians, see the world as the man upstairs is God, and there's the heaven, heavenly beings and our, our relatives who died and angels that are upstairs. And we're downstairs, and sometimes you can hear them creaking around up there. Creak, creak, creak. And so there's a sense of relationship, but there's no interaction. Maybe you, you tap on the ceiling to get some kind of response. But there's this the separation that exists between the upstairs and the downstairs. The Father Stephen points out very beautifully in his book, in his blog, and in his sermons, uh, I recommend them, um, he points out that this is not the Orthodox Christian view of the world. Our view would be uh, the world is a one-story universe, and God is among us in the sacraments. He's among us in each other. He's among us in, through the Holy Spirit. He's among us as we pray. When we make our cross, you know, it's a sign He's with us. Uh, when we look at icons, it's a sign He's with us. We see Him in the icons. When we experience the Eucharist, or church architecture. All these things are showing us that in fact um, the things of this world 
relate God to us. The very sacramental theology of our faith shows us the nearness and the imminence of the Lord. And so that's an important point. And we want to think about that. We don't live in a two-story universe. We live in a one-story universe. St. Paisios of the Holy Mountain said, Wherever Christ is, there is paradise. Wherever we are, Christ is there. And there is paradise, potentially. St. Isaac of Syria said, This life has been given to us for repentance right now. Do not waste it in vain pursuits. There's the immediacy of this for him. God is with us. We have my wonderful hero, Father Alexander Schmemann, who said, It is this world and not any other world. It is this life and not some other life that were given to us for communion with God. It is only through this world, this life, by transforming them into communion with God, that man can actually be. And so the opportunity for us is to encounter the Lord here and now. Father Alexander often spoke about communion. Um, the word in Greek oftentimes for fellowship is kinonia, koinonia, kinonia, fellowship. For Orthodox, participation is always real. Um, in Lent, second Sunday of Lent, we commemorate St. Gregory Palamas, who defended the reality that God is present in the world. Not just, not just His created properties, but God Himself, His energies are illumining and present with us in the sacraments, in the prayers, in us. God is with us. Understand all you nations. Submit yourselves, for God is with us. I want to end by uh, sharing some thoughts from Father Stephen Freeman about an Orthodox worldview. He says this. He speaks about the fullness of the faith. He said, I prefer to use the term fullness when describing Orthodox faith because it is far more explanatory than simply saying that we are the true church. Fullness, of course, does not deny that we're the true church, but it moves us on to more fruitful ground. And so I, I share a list, he says, of what seem to me to be important consequences of giving one's life to the fullness of faith, of living life, if you will, centered in an orthodox worldview. The fullness of the faith inspires us to accept as our conviction these things. It is to accept the corporate nature of our salvation. The model of what it means to be a Christian is found in the life of the Holy Trinity. Thus we no longer live for ourselves, but for everything and everyone. It is to embrace the Christian faith without one-sidedness. Thus we do not reduce Christianity to a tension between grace and law, or to an expression merely of the sovereignty of God, or any other reductionist models that have come to be in the past half millennium. It is to embrace the incarnate God, Jesus Christ, as the full and complete revelation to us of God. His words, His life, His actions are the complete salvation for all mankind. As he said on the cross, it is finished. It is complete. It is to accept that the faith is larger than we are, that we cannot reduce it down to anything less than its fullness and be faithful to it. The consequence of this last point is that we attend church always with an attitude of humility, for we are standing within the larger life which is itself revealing God to us. We also renounce ourselves as autonomous individuals, and recognize instead that we are children of the one God who directs our lives in His commandments and that He alone is the definition and the meaning of our life. We accept that the holy mysteries of the church, such as baptism, chrismation, penance, confession, Eucharist, unction, marriage, ordination, monastic tonsure, are means by which God gives His very life to us, though He may give His life to us in many other ways as well. Thus we view this life of mystery as our true life and not simply an organizational expression of the church. We accept that we are only the current representatives of this faith on earth, but that we are joined by a great cloud of witnesses, the saints, by whose prayers we are aided and by whose holy relics we are encouraged to run the race faithfully to its end. Thus we honor them as holy friends, our companions on the road to salvation. Among the saints we recognize the unique place of the Mother of God, whose obedience to the Word of God undid the disobedience of Eve, and through whose cooperation with the working of God, salvation became incarnate in the God-man Jesus Christ. 
We recognize and accept that our salvation is nothing other than true and living communion with God the Father through His Son and in the Holy Spirit. This salvation is a whole life and not one single decision. It is a life lived in community, the, the church, the body of Christ. It lacks nothing for God, for God has provided it with all that is necessary for our salvation. We recognize the authority of the scriptures within the life of the church, and we accept that the apostles, with the apostles that all of scripture is understood only as it reveals Jesus Christ. For these, he says, are they which testify of me, speaking of the scriptures. We recognize as well that scripture is a gift to the church, and we read them in and through the living tradition of the church as expressed by the Holy Fathers and expressed by the worshiping life of the church and by the decisions of the councils of faith. We see in the world an icon of the world to come. We see the scriptures as an icon, the saints as icons, the church as icon, and we live for the age when all things will be made known fully. We believe that the fullness of the faith can only be known through the revelation of God as we follow the way of the cross, tracing the steps of Christ's humility, taking upon ourselves as he took upon himself the sins of the world, and from within that humility praying for all to the gracious God who alone can save. This is, this is all an outgrowth, if you will, of our rootedness in the worldview of the Orthodox faith. May God help us to hold to that faith and to be challenged, not just intellectually, but in terms of the very center of our being. But our next installment will be creation, Christ is new creation, and the foundations of the Christian preaching, or the proclamation of Christ. I'm Father Justin Patterson. Thank you for watching our Intro to Orthodoxy series. We're really glad you're joining us for this. We invite you to engage with us in person. Come visit our parish. Come see, taste and see that the Lord is good by visiting our community. Also, take advantage of our website, our YouTube channel, and all the contact information that you'll find on the screen. Thank you very much, and may God bless you.